you are not going to have pain. Right. You're not going to have pain in your knees. You're not going to have pain everywhere because unfortunately, Dr. G from FCMW, and here is another episode of Healthy Exchanges with Dr. G. The biggest part of my practice is about informing the, the, the community about all the great people that are medical connected, med doctors, and medically adjacent, giving all of our patients a chance to, to get as much information about their own health and make better informed decisions when they are making a decision about their health. Today, I have a very special guest, a good friend of mine in a short time, because I think we align a lot in, in the way we care about our patients. Just recently, we had a case that we're gonna talk about shortly that I think embodies what it means between two doctors that, um, that can join forces, for, join forces to save a patient's outcome. Um, Dr. Alvaro Garcia is a general surgeon here in Hollywood, Florida, with a specialty in bariatric surgery, but he does it a very special way. He has a unique ability to use a robot, which he's gonna tell us more about, to minimally invasively get into the, the patient's body and leave very small marks and therefore improve the patient's outcome overall. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Alvaro Garcia. Thank you very much, thank you. I really appreciate it from being here. Uh, my name is Alvaro Garcia. I am a general surgeon. I was born in Colombia, raised in Venezuela, did my med school in University Central of Venezuela or Universidad Central de Venezuela. Then I came to United States and did my internship at Yale University and then did residency in Georgetown and did a fellowship that combines colorectal surgery and minimally invasive surgery. During this very interesting fellowship that I did in Orlando, I learned with the MD Ander Cancer Center all the different advanced techniques of minimal invasive surgery for colon and general surgery. So it was a great moment of time where the development of the laparoscopy, it was growing so, so fast that from that moment on, after I finished my residency, immediately started to work with robotics. This is dating back to 2009, where uh, robotic, uh, it was starting the second generation of the commercially available Da Vinci. The Da Vinci is it's, it's basically a robot that put those little arms through small incisions in the abdomen, through trockers, and allows you to do precise surgery. So I jumped in, the, in the, the van wagon immediately recognizing this is going to be a technology that was going to change the world. And I performed the first robotic colon resection in Pembroke Pines back in 2009. And actually, the news came back down to, to, to interview me. So it was a great moment uh, the, the, the Da Vinci get started at that time. And since then, I've been able to perform thousands, actually, of cases of minimal invasive surgery to the Da Vinci. And more recently, over the past years, I have become very interested in bariatric surgery. And I adapt all the minimal invasive technologies and all the minimal invasive uh, capabilities of the Da Vinci and to combine a really safe, fast, and great procedure, which is called a gastric sleeve, robotic gastric sleeve. So how do I get into that? I think became part of like, the same things that's happening to a lot of people in medicine. You're seeing wellness coming down, you're seeing weights getting larger, waist mm -hmm. getting a little bit larger. And then uh, I became a very uh, uh, specialized in complex ventral hernia repairs. And then turns out that after certain weight and height, the ventral hernia doesn't respond well to surgery mm -hmm. because the body doesn't have the capabilities to heal well. So I, I felt that it was necessary that to me to jump into bariatric surgery. So a few years, five, year, five, seven years back, starting to perform robotic gastric sleeve. It's, and then uh, it's, I think it's my favorite surgery out of all the surgeries that I've ever done. And I do a lot of things I do 
minimal invasive robotic hernia repairs, inguinal hernia, gallbladder surgery, colon surgery, esophagus surgery, um, you name it. And I think once I perform the gastric sleeve and follow the patients for years, I realized that not only they lost weight, which I, don't, I think is, is beyond the point, it's just the patients became a new person. Mm. They left a body that wasn't theirs and they went back to who they, who they really were. Right. And I think it's a, the gastric sleeve has something that I still would love to understand what, what, how does it work physiologically. I think one of the major chocks into the body immediately happens days after surgery. There is some changes in the hormonal behavior of the body. And I think patients lose weight, not just because they lose weight, because they actually lose edema. So right. it turns out it's a lot of fluid. I see patients, they retain large amount of edema in their hands and their ankles, and they're, they're actually swollen. And one of the places that we see tremendous swelling is in the throat. So that's why the surgery is complicated because their, their throats are very big and, mm -hmm. the, and the things inside are very big. And I think what we see pe people that have a little bit larger necks, there actually is edema as opposed to fat itself, it's just edema of the, so of the soft tissues. So we see a shock in the hemost and the changes of the water homeostasis, and patients actually lost, they can lose up to 10, 20 pounds within a week. Wow, that's Just that's from tremendous. edema. So that's, this is one of the, the shocking parts of, of the, uh, the gastric sleep. And as I make the, the stomach a banana shape and leave the motor of the stomach, which is the antrum, mm -hmm. patients have literally normal life because they, they have a smaller portions that come in and have a great engine that can digest and push the foot forward. So you actually can eat normally, but just a smaller portions, right. which is something that we have discussed in, in terms of what is it that the, the first thing you, I ask you today, what is the first thing that you do when you get somebody, they wanna be in your program and they're committed? You say portion. Yeah, portion control is number one. Portion control is number one. So the gastric sleeve, I think, in combination with the new uh, GLPs and the new medications that we have, we can achieve this long-term uh, um, control. But uh, going back to to where I am, I am I'm very interested on in, on on participating in this interview with you because I wanted to bring the awareness that the what matters in terms of health is get the patients to be in combination with two doctors that can oversee the entire right. holistic care of the, pa of the patient from the medical standpoint and the surgical standpoint because we can't get away from the symbiosis. Right. So once we have the right tools to get the patients motivated to wanted to do better, to wanted to regain the, themselves. So we have different tools. And this is, this is one of the things where, where it, I think I would love people to be aware how easy it is to get a gastric sleeve. It's right. a surgery that can last under 40 minutes in one night in the hospital, right. which is not even required anymore. We're doing this outpatient, patients going home the same day because the technology has allowed for this to happen, plus the Da Vinci, the Da Vinci is the allowed. Da Vinci. That. The Da Vinci yeah. is probably the biggest, the biggest, one of the biggest um, uh, innovations I think in 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 general surgery, probably in the last you know twenty years, probably I don't know you you, you know better than me, but I, I see I see patients in and out, and like you said, a surgery that would be like you know four or five days post op now is an outpatient thing. Yeah, that's that's amazing, and 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 I I think also the fact that you know it's become you know, more, I, well, we still need specialists like yourself. Um, the, the machine is very expensive, <laughs> you know, well, we have to have you know, major centers have them, but it's becoming more commonplace, I think, um, across the U.S. But, you know, we meet guys like you that can train the younger guys that are coming up on how to do this because you are, you know, like you said, the very first one in Pembroke Pines, that's, that's huge. That's, you're a pioneer. Um, and what I heard from you, um, is that you are not afraid to jump in and, um, and, and use your skills 
you know, on both sides of the diaphragm. Not every general surgeon is, is ready to do that, you know, esophageal surgery and, you know, um, below the diaphragm and, and, and work there and, and, and go everywhere, you know, gallbladder surgeries as well. That's not, that's not common. That's not a common thing. Um, can, can you tell me a little bit more about what it's like to be, you know, fully engulfed inside of the Da Vinci device? What is it like to be in control of that device and, and performing a surgery? Um, not, you know, if you, if you, you know, the people don't know, they've never seen one. Um, what is, what, what's like, what is it like for you? Well, first, it, what, once I'm in the console doing the surgery, I'm in the happiest place on earth. The time, I mean, the time doesn't pass to me. Right. Because I'm fully, I'm fully engaged into, into the operation. So the machine, what it works, I, I compare it to a helicopter. In a helicopter, you have to control four different variables with your both limbs, with your arms and your hands. So in the Da Vinci, the, the most, well, I think one of the most interesting parts of the Da Vinci is that the surgeon regains the control of the camera. So the visualization is what I need to see. So basically, I am looking at what I'm going to do as opposed to coordinate with a second person, which is laparoscopy. So is the old joke in the laparoscopy is the surgeon is getting dizzy because the person is looking somewhere else. Right. Though you're making me dizzy because the camera is moving and is moving and is looking somewhere else. So a second person cannot automatically connect to your brain to know where are you looking and what is your next step. So what is in the, the Da Vinci? Once I get to put the four, the four little ports, which is the little little cannulas that allow you to go through the abdominal wall and you get the air into the patient, which is CO2. We have one really interesting new technique of ventilate or putting the air in the abdomen. We have a special machine that synchronizes with your lungs. So the air comes out as you breathe. So the pneumoperitoneum, which is the air inside, goes in and out with your breath. Because you might have heard that laparoscopy or the air can give you back pain, it can give you symptoms, it can give you discomfort, it can give you pain. Well, with this new technique, there actually is going to be, it's actually, this is like a breakthrough with the Da Vinci, it's going to coordinate directly with your breathing through the ventilator, through sensors where you are actually breathing. So the likelihood that you have pain, even, it goes even lower. Right. So after that part is done, and, and I have what a great, a new great advantage. All of a sudden, I have three arms, which is not what I used to have. <laughs> Once I get three cannulas and a camera, I can have two right arms or two left arms and the camera. So I control the cameras with my feet, and I control the two arms with my hands. And I can toggle and switch between which arm I decide to use, and I can assist myself. So think about it. Once I'm doing surgery, two other persons have lost their jobs. Yeah, basically. <laughs> because, which is terrible, but it, which it's, is terrible. But at the same time, <laughs> no one can assist you as yourself. Right. So when I use my third arm, either left or right, I I am preparing to do with my two hands while the third hand is showing me. And I'm setting up the camera and I'm looking at what I'm doing, setting it up myself and doing the surgery. So the ultimate result is I can actually become very efficient. Bingo. So I think that this is one of the reasons why when I do a, a robotic procedure, for example, like a, a gallbladder, my console time, it turns out actually is shorter than my laparoscopic time because I'm actually doing all three parts of the surgery with the visualization, assistance, and performance of the surgery by one person and one brain. Yep. So I think that the, when it's suitable that I can use all arms, I am a lot faster and a lot better. So what is it when I'm there? When I'm there, 
I, it's another world. I wish you can put your head into the console because the, the way they created this is they have a, a camera that is 8K, it's stroboscopic, which means they have two eyes. They project a three-dimensional view into 71 mirrors in the console. So it's mm. actually some sort of a trick. That's what the console is covered mm. because the stroboscopic view is projected into different mirrors until they project back the digital, the digital final view into two different cameras. And the two cameras go separate to each one of your eyes. Wow. And when it mix in your brain, the sensation for the person operating is that you have an absolute identical view of what you do three-dimensionally with your hands. With one advantage, you have up to 10 times zoom, you have just better control of the lightning because you can software adjusts all the lights within the inside of the abdominal cavity. So you actually see better than if you have to open somebody because you have to adjust certain lights. You, your pupils move differently. Your pupils react differently to different lights. Mm. So this light is by design allows you to keep your pupils open. So you are like a cheetah that is praying in the middle of the night. You can, <laughs> in the middle so. of the night because <laughs> you can see through things that you otherwise you wouldn't. Right. And now it comes the part that is even more crazy. We have going into the fluorescent medicine surgery. So we have noticed that when you inject the patients intravenously, a uh, green contrast called indiocene green, mm -hmm. and a certain different light lightnings levels, you can actually see the circulation of the arterial blood, Wow. The venous blood, the bile, and allows you to differentiate where the cancer cells move within the body. Wow, that is, that's powerful stuff. Like you can actually see which vessels are which now. So it's yes. not, you're not like, you know, I, I know you guys, surgeons, well, well, well-trained surgeons and well, you know, surgeons with a lot of uh, experience can tell what a vessel, which vessel is which, but now you visually you're seeing what's what. And you can see actually what you know bile bile ducts and all that. That's that is um, that's powerful stuff. I mean, I I would imagine that just makes mistakes even less probable. You know, uh, probable. Let's just say let me let let's bring up a, a recent case. Okay. That we have together. Right. Right. We have a, a elderly gentleman came from out of the country, mm -hmm. very sick with a gallbladder, and the the patient felt so comfortable to speak to you, to you direct the care of his father, which yeah. is an octogenarian, mm -hmm. nice, male, nice man, who had family, they were doctors around the country. Right. And they listened to you more than any family member they're, they're involved in medicine, because they knew that you actually had taken care of his son so well, they, they were absolutely trust trusting you what your advice would be. Right. So you contact me, you ask me, listen, I have somebody that needs that sort of I, There was no one else I was gonna call. There was no one else I was gonna call. So Friday afternoon, Friday evening, um, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I, didn't, I couldn't think of anyone else that I was gonna call anyway, but I knew no one else would answer the phone, right? That's the, that's the deal. I mean, th those are the type of doctors that I, I like to, and those are the type of colleagues I like to talk to, right? And I like to uh, you know, align myself with, people that care. And I call him, I call doctor, um, I, I call you, and of course, on the second ring, hey, professor. And what did you say next, brother? I said, bring him in to, bring it to me. So I brought the patient to the emergency yep. room, perform a full workup with MRI, CAT scan, ultrasounds, everything we know. And uh, as uh, generally things happened, it, the hospital called their own physicians, which they were in, very ready to take the patient for surgery right away, mm. but it wasn't my opinion that the best care was to do a delay 
-hmm. with uh, control of the, the, the infection, the sepsis, prevent sepsis. And then it's a complex case, but we drain the gallbladder in order to decrease the chances of the gallbladder to rupture and then in order to repair, allow the liver to repair itself because the liver was very sick because of the severe amount of infection that it was going on, which will make a surgical, uh, surgical procedure very risky and difficult. So after the patients get drained, went home for two weeks, and then I took him for a robotic gallbladder removal. Right. So what the first thing that I that I that I noticed is it was an infection that's been sitting there for months. Yeah. And the drainage allowed me to localize the gallbladder right away because we saw the drain coming into the gallbladder. And one thing that is something that never told you, but once the patients have acute cholecystitis, meaning the gallbladder is obstructed. Mm -hmm. So when the gallbladder is obstructed, the dye that I use to see the biliary, the biliary system, it doesn't enter the gallbladder mm -hmm. and it doesn't enter a very important structure called the cystic duct, mm -hmm. which is, is a structure that connects. The liver comes here, the bile, the main bile duct comes from here, and then the cystic duct goes to the side and goes to the gallbladder. Right. When we use the dye that I told you, the indiocene green, the green can go into the bile duct, but it doesn't go into the cystic duct Correct. because it's obstructed and doesn't go into the gallbladder. So I lose the advantage of seeing these structures. Right. And in an area where it's inflamed, the cystic duct is very hard to be found visually because the tissues, they look the same and there's a lot of inflammation. So by having done the drain, once the pressure goes down, the gallbladder obstruction generally re improves and the stone that is stuck in the neck of the gallbladder comes back out. And I know that that's happening because the drainage of the pa that was going in the drain changes colors. So the first time is like bad black bile mm -hmm. that is infected. And in a week, it's normal looking bile, right. which means the system it has opened up. Right. So that, with that in mind, when I saw the bile switching, you say this is time, time to, go. to go. Time to go. Because I'm gonna not the inflammation is never gonna get that much better. But he's not septic. He's not sick anymore. He has actually no pain. He was dying before the drainage, and then the pain went completely away. And I kept him on antibiotics. And when I did the surgery, the the beauty of this is like with a robot. I have not only the robot, but I have a surgical assistant that is my PA that has been, we've been working for years together. And on top of the four arms, we have all extra two uh, true incisions for my assistant that was doing extra help separating and performing suctioning and this until I was able to vis visualize the entire biliary tree, which is the gallbladder, the common bile duct and the cystic duct. Mm -hmm. And, and if without the eye, the, the indus and green, I would not be able to see the cystic duct. Right. And then we confirmed the cystic duct. Not only that, we found the patient have an abnormality of how the cystic duct and the bile duct are connected. So we found something that happens in less than 1% of humans, and we're able to prevent an error by being able to visualize it. So the case went very well. We finish the surgery accordingly yeah. to the, the standards of getting a gallbladder. And the patient went home in a day or so. And then Thank you. he's back into Peru. Yeah, he's on his, he's on his way back home. Um, yeah, the, the family member is, a, is one of my concierge patients. See him on the concierge side. Um, he felt comfortable enough. And we do have that service for the concierge patients that we see family members as part of the, um, part of the service. So he, he reached out and I fit him in on a Friday. And, and, and that's the story. And I think, and I think, the interplay between a, a physician, a primary care doctor like myself, and a, and a, a very competent and accomplished um, surgeon like yourself is important. It can't be overstated because the decisions that are made, the, the, the correct decisions have to be made all the way along the way in order to have an outcome like that. Any way we'd have gone left or right on that case, it could have been, I don't know if it would have been you know terrible, but it could have been bad for the patient. Um, he would not have been on his way back to where he's going. So um, I, I, I want to say thank you to that. Uh, thank you for answering oh, my call. Welcome. And thank you for being so attentive. The whole weekend, you know, I'm bothered, hey, help, help me. Um, 
you know, because you know th these these things are important to me. You know, these are my these are my these are my my patients, um, my patients' family. They, they expect good outcomes from us, and me choosing a, a person or a doctor, a person who cares, and a doctor who is competent. Those two things are two different things, right? Mashed into one is very important. That's those are the people we consult with, and these are the type of doctors like yourself that I endeavor to find in this community to offer up to my patients because the outcomes are a lot better. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you've built your practice? And if, if, if your practice is all insurance based, is there another way to get a, a surgery by someone like yourself um, at your practice? Absolutely. I, 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 I noticed the, the need in the community of surgeons they, uh, and physicians and surgeons like me, they can't perform these high-end procedures in a cash base. And, and actually, um, uh, I've been able to, through leverage with hospitals, to create a price structure that is literally unheard of, mm. uh, probably in the United, in the continental United States. Just for example, to give you an example, would I give you, give you exact numbers? Mm -hmm. uh, a robotic gastric leave in New York it probably costs four times what it costs here, right? And uh, to be self-pay. And why is that? I would say ninety percent of that money is because the hospitals are going to charge like they're charging an insurance company. Mm. So they, they, they don't have a differentiation of somebody that is paying from out of pocket. Let's just give you an example. If they charge $1,000 to insurance, somebody out of pocket, you can charge them $400, $300, because the insurance, maybe at the hospital, they charge 1000 they might get 300 anyway. Right. So what is the point to charge the person that is paying what the insurance is going to pay? Mm-hmm. So I was able to get that through the administrative channels. And also uh, something that really helped is the, the, the new law that is called the transparency law. Uh, that, that transparency law it also was a, a very important boost to be able to create this very well transparent process for patients. So which it means is within anyone means to be able to have a robotic surgery performed. Right. In, and um, a, a lot of patients, I would say 75, 80% of the times is, is insurance based, mm -hmm. but there are some patients that they either insurance don't have coverage, their deductibles are too high, or they're not allowing them to use these advanced procedures because some insurance might want to ask some cost saving measures and smaller hospitals with outpatient centers where the outcomes they might not be bad, but they're not going to be as good. So it's in the right of the patient the, to invest in themselves and get the surgery that they feel meets their needs. Right. And, and they get the, the surgeon that provides the service within reason, not within like extraordinary amounts of money. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to perform robotic inguinal hernia, robotic umbilical hernia, robotic gastric sleeve, endoscopies, colonoscopies, and, and also I'm very open to take care of patients that come outside of a country. I have patients that yeah. come from the Bahamas, patients that come from Haiti, I have patients that come from Colombia, I have patients that come from Brazil, I have patients that come from all over parts of the world where the access to these technologies is not as common, it's not there, and, and then they like to come to, to our centers. And actually I have a program where we have, in certain hospitals, we have a very nice, wonderful hotels that accommodate my patients and give them a really great, a great deal. We uh -huh. use a, a, a place called Coral Springs and, and they have a, a deal with a hospital that is literally within like walking distance to the hospital and it's a very, very nice hotel. Uh -huh. So we have patients that come, in, uh, come out of town, we coordinate, we'll help them get in their hotels, we and get in their procedures. And generally what I do, patients that come out from out of state or uh, which have been, I would say 50% of patients that have done gastric sleeves that have come from out of state nice. and, and, and out of a country, we will help them in a system to get to where they need to be. 
in those patients, they're, it, they're making such an effort that they will do a lot of things for them. For mm -hmm. example, we allowed medical clearances to be performed in where they are. Okay. We, in, we set up the entire care for the patient and then we review this online and I speak with physicians from other parts of the country and different parts. I mean, I have a patient that came from Boston recently for a gastric sleeve and then discuss with his hematologies, his issues. And, and then, and, and, and it's great because the patients are able to reach what they would reach otherwise somewhat else. Right. I have a patient says, well, I had the match general, which is a Harvard hospital across of me, but they don't take my insurance. No one will see me and I will never get the surgery for three years. Mm -hmm. And he says, and then his out of pocket was so high that will cost him literally 80% of what the whole charge was here, cash. Mm -hmm. And so the patient say, well, I'm booking a flight, get the surgery done, and went back to Boston. And they couldn't believe in Boston that he had the surgery done. Yeah, right. He went yeah, well, back. You got it done in fucking You got Florida. it done for what? That's it? And, and, then, and then we, we, we really make it very easy for these patients. I love it. I'll see them the day before the surgeries. They come, we meet. So we don't meet the day of the surgery, uh -huh. which is still fine because I've seen them through virtual That's consultations. Great. So they come, they meet me. They get to the office, we'll do one more examination. And the good thing is, actually, the outcomes are so good because we have put so much care into this. Bingo. So by the time the patient has seen me the day before the surgery, I have reviewed his preparative labs and studies probably more than anyone else. Right. Because so this is, yeah, you've built a system. You built, I, I, I didn't even know that you do that. that that's an amazing, that's an amazing um, 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 feature of your office, you know, th that we have travel medicine here in, in Hollywood, in this area, in Pembroke Pines, that people are coming in from different countries in different part of the, this country to get their surgeries done. And it sounds kind of like, I'm, I, I hate to tell you, Alvaro, it sounds like um, um, concierge medicine. It, um, it is. You know, it, it I think like it what is. we do here in this office. I think, I think it is. And then, yeah, man. And then, and then I think from, from now on, I'm going to get you involved in this because yeah. the other thing we have done is uh, we have set up the patients to come with their studies done in their laboratory and data, and they come to get a medical clearance with you yeah. where you review the data and examine them and get the history and get done. And uh, we, we recently, also talking about Boston, we have a patient whose PCP denied to write a medical clearance letter for the procedure because she was a 40 year old healthy woman. He said, well, I'm not, I don't agree that you need labs. I think your labs are going to come back normal and your sex is going to be normal. So I'm not going to do labs or an EKG or anything because I just give you the clearance and a prescription. Well, uh, we told the patient, okay, don't, the patient was very upset with the primary. And I explained to her there's no anesthesiologist in the continental United States that will agree with something like that <laughs> for a, that a, general, a general surgery procedure under general anesthesia. So we get everything done. I order, I orchestrated to get everything done in Boston. And she came here and she saw a doctor that is behind my plaza. Right. He cleared her. We got the paperwork done within days. And... She did fantastically, right? And she was very, very happy they were they were able to accommodate it. So That's I will I'll be glad to bring you all these patients to you. Yeah, we'll help them get everything done, and they'll they're just they're basically your concierge patient because they're actually self pay anyway. Yeah, for the medical clearance. Yeah, as long as as long as it, you know the relationship is 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 built um, between you you and, and and the physician, primary care physician, myself, or other ones that you've built the relationship with. The patient is who really benefits in the end. Yes. You know, because yes. she was looking for surgery and was held up because of X, Y, Z reason why the surgeon decided that, you know, they would not sign off on the, on the, um, the clearance. You know, it's just, you know, it's just unfortunate that someone would get in the way of, you know, a, a surgery that a patient needs or wants and there's an indication for it. So yeah, they absolutely, we, here at, Concierge, at, at Florida Concierge Medicine and Wellness, we're definitely on board for that type of relationship. Um, I believe we've already built one 
on the insurance side, building one on the concierge side would be even easier without you know the 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 the, the red tape that we have to go through with the insurance <laughs> side. Let me let me ask you uh, let me ask you one more question, and I ask this question uh, to a lot of my guests. So, Alvaro, when when you're when you're when you're gone, and there's no more Da Vinci's to Da Vinci, right? And um, you know, and 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 your maker takes you away. What would you would like them to say about you ten years after, after you're gone, and what you've built um, here in this community, and what you've done here? What would you like the people to remember you for? I, I, this is a beautiful question. I always think about a legacy. I think legacy is the, leg, the legacy that you built is outgrow uh, your own, your own self. And I think what I want to see is that patients they have undergo to complex surgical procedures, and they, they, are, they are alive and well, and they are they can remember and pinpoint a very crucial moment on their life where they're, they were in a crossroad and, and then things went well. Mm -hmm. And I think having done over 10, probably 15,000 surgeries since I started. Easy. I think the, and I'm doing more surgeries than I ever did. I think what, what that, that that mini microcosmos of the patients that I that I've been taken care of, they're like uh, they're like light that expands because they understand that there is surgeons they care, they are, they're gonna say, well, he care about me, he called my doctor, he saw me three times, he saw me and gave me a hug, and he said, well, things are gonna, they could be rough, but they, we're gonna do the best we can. And I'm there with you. So I wanted to remember that, I, well, he was a surgeon, they care. They care for the patients. And, they, and I, I wanted to, one guy who's going to 80, you know, he had my inguinal hernias done and I play golf for 10 more years because of that. So and that is what I think I see the legacy. The, the happiness that I, that, I, that, that I give people by using my skills and to getting them back where they 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 want to be and they they should and they serve to be and then the other one is it get this caring image to the world that we do physicians do care that we physicians do, we do care, care of the outcome that we build the relationships for the outcomes that we build professional relationships so i i i, I want it to be Remember in the community of my group of so, uh, specialists as surgeons, as the surgeon that was approachable, the one that was humble, the one they asked for help, and the one they give help. So and then and then and then change the attitude of medicine. I I I can I'm very proud to say that I'm very good friends with all my competitors, which it has actually has benefit me tremendously because I have only have got a right uh, a, a helping hand in any situation that I have and that has allowed me to participate in collaboration with physicians that otherwise I will not be able to see so right. this is one thing that we have as surgeons is like a, we as me 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 and, and you don't see what else is out there mm -hmm. but I am they know me in the or as a Surgeon that walks and walk into everybody's room and see how they're doing and and learn and teach me what are you doing mm -hmm. and they're and they're all laughing because they said you can teach me what you do <laughs> <laughs> but I, I you can learn from anyone so this is this is I think the legacy that I want to build I love it I love it I love it Dr Garcia um, I was giving a talk at the chamber last week and one of the topics the the topic was unlocking the the secrets to um, a healthy lifestyle. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that, you know, um, using your body. It's you, you have one body. It's not a lease. It's not, you know, it's not a rental. This is, the, you bought this. You know, it's from zero to 100. This is yours, right? And you need to use this body to do all of the life work that you need. You know, and how much, you, how much good use you get out of it depends on how much you put into it. And it all starts with lifestyle, you know, your lifestyle. And that's what my job is as a primary care doctor is to teach keeping this thing as, as, as tip-top shape as possible. 
You know, you may get into an accident. You may get, you know, something might break. And if it does, I've got Alvaro for that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I've, got, I've got Dr. Garcia for that. And that's what, you know, that's what we have these trusted relationships. Yeah, you got to take this thing to the body shop. You know, Gar <laughs> Dr. Garcia is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to do what he needs to do to get it back in, back on the road. And we're going to back on this lifestyle, this lifestyle road that we need to be on. So you have to treat this, you know, this, this, this vehicle well. You know, and so you can get the most use. So you can, you know, hang out with your kids for as long as possible. You can walk down the aisle with your daughter. You can, you know, you know, watch sunsets with your wife. Um, you can grow old, and your kids aren't taking care of you at, when you're 55 because you had a stroke or you know or some other thing. You know, that's my job to get help, give people information as much information as possible, so they can do, you know, do all the great things that they they want to do with the passion of their life. That's, that's how I see my job. I think it's that important to me. And that, that's how I see it. That's great. I mean, I, I always try to put this in perspective to the patients. Um, let's say maybe people towards obesity, for example. Uh, we know that you can live a very long life too if you are overweight or have obesity. But the question comes is, what is your quality of life? Hmm. What is the quality of life that you achieve in the time that you have on earth. So I give an example. I said, okay, by the time you're 50, if you are not within the limits that the body that your body wants, you're making your heart and lungs to work twice as hard. Yeah. You're making your joints, they're like they're being given to you in one specific thickness to withstand a weight that you can't. I give the example, you want a Volkswagen to carry the load of a truck that is coming off out of the, the, um, the chip, you're gonna get one of the shipments and, and toy with a, with a Volkswagen, you can't. The Volkswagen is gonna eventually break. Right. So I tell patients, what you want is the life that you have after 40, when you are more likely to have achieved some freedom from the economical standpoint, is that you are gonna be able to, as you said, take a walk. You're gonna be able to breathe. You're gonna be able to go on a vacation. You're gonna be able mm. to walk two miles if you need to. But not only that, you are not gonna have pain. Right. You're not going to have pain in your knees. You're not going to have pain everywhere. Because unfortunately, as we age, even the most health, healthy person, it will have a problem. Yeah. And your problems, they're going to magnify. And the magnification of the problem is going to make you unlikely that you have the reserves to overcome things that will come your way. Bingo. So... All the things that come our way are cancers. And then the circumference of the abdomen determines how, what are your chances of having prostate cancer. Mm. In women, the circumference of their belly determines what, how many chances they have to have breast cancer because they're just hormonal cancers. The extra fat accumulated in the body makes your body to more likely to use one of those hormones to give you your own cells a problem and then you, can you avoid a breast cancer yes if you lose weight if your weight goes back down to normal you could be off the risk of having breast cancer mm. and right there you have gained 20 years of your life <laughs> you have saved yourself chemotherapy mastectomy and endless follow-up with doctors not a, not to mention the amount to mention the stress that you've also put on your family who also worry about you and love you and, and want to see you do well and you are ill, you know, you, 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 can, you can remove that, that part of the, you know, the, the, your story. That chapter in the book doesn't have to be written that way. And that all is done years ago. And the lifestyle modifications and lifestyle choices that you make. Um, and, and that's our job, to help these patients who sometimes they just don't know. Many times they don't know. Um, and that's job, our job to educate them. So it's, it's, it's huge. You definitely do care. There's no doubt about that. We've, we, 
this last case that we just talked about was something that we texted about and talked and spoke to each other about constantly until this, this, this case was actually, you know, buttoned up and the patient now is on his way home. So I am, um, I'm so thankful. I'm so honored. And it's a privilege to have you here at FCMW to visit our space and to be on healthy exchanges with Dr. G. Um, that's about all we have for today, but man, man, I think we have a lot of value in today's episode. So if you'd like to get in touch with Dr. Alvaro Garcia here in Pembroke Pines in the Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida area, go ahead and take a look down in the, down in the description below. Um, we have all of his contacts. You'll have my contacts. And also don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for our next episode with Healthy Exchanges with Dr. G. Dr. Alvaro Garcia, the eminent <laughs> and professor. Thank you I, so much. I appreciate you coming really on the show today, it. man. It was it was great. For having me here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time. <laughs>